So hello everyone. So welcome to this uh, ASHRAE webinar. So my name is uh, Dr. Sam Hui. I'm the moderator and also the representative of the uh, Government Affairs Committee of ASHRAE. So our webinar will start uh, very soon. So on behalf of uh, ASHRAE Society, we are grateful for a large number of attendees. And also we have received a large number of applicants for these uh, webinars. Therefore, actually we have uh, upgrade or uh, adjust uh, the platform for the webinar. From webinar, actually we are using a webcast platform to do that so that we can uh, cater for more attendance. So according to our registration list, uh, there are people coming from different countries around the world. So that means uh, they are also at different time zone. And I also uh, have uh, read some comments from the uh, applicants uh, telling us that uh, the time zone or the timing uh, is may not be very convenient for them. For example, people in Hawaii or the uh, west coast of US or the uh, west part of the South Americans, they are a little bit early in the morning. And we have to say uh, uh, apologies to them because uh, we have to select a right uh, timing for uh, most of the uh, participants. But hopefully uh, you will also enjoy this. Or if uh, some people are not able to attend because of the timing, uh, we will have the video recording and they can also watch uh, the video recording of the webinar at a later time. So without further ado, uh, I would like to uh, kickstart the webinar uh, right now. So this webinar is uh, jointly hosted by the Government Affairs Committee and the uh, Epidemic uh, Task Force of ASHRAE. And this is the uh, information that you should note it because uh, uh, when you are uh, uh, connected to uh, the webinar, uh, you will be automatically mute for the entire period of the webcast, just in case uh, the, the, the noise uh, may affect the speakers. So if you would like to raise a question, ask a question, please uh, click on the icon on the right hand side of your screen, and then you can type your question together with your email and name. And in case uh, you are not able to raise a question during uh, that time, you can still contact us. Uh, we have the uh, email address of the uh, epidemic task force. Please note that the, this event is being recorded and uh, the re video recording and the presentation file will be made available after the uh, event. Okay, this is the outline we are going to uh, carry out in the next uh, one and a half hour. So we have three speakers. So you can see that we have three specific topics uh, to be delivered by each speaker. And we will also uh, put some question and answers time uh, at the end of the webinar. And in fact, we have uh, received quite a number of uh, questions uh, from the registration form of the webinar. And we have already selected some uh, questions uh, that uh, we believe will be uh, very constructive. And we will try to dis uh, highlight this uh, at the end of this webinar. But at the same time, if you have uh, your question uh, to be raised uh, during the uh, presentation, please feel free to do that using the uh, chat board. Uh, we have three uh, distinguished uh, speakers uh, to, uh, in this uh, webinars. And you can see that uh, Professor William P. Uh, P. Bamford from the Penn State Universities. He actually is the chair of the ASHRAE Epidemic Task Force. And together with two colleagues who are also uh, from the ASHRAE uh, uh, Epidemic uh, Task Force, they will be uh, talking about in different uh, aspects 
uh, including the commercial and uh, residential building or, or in general, the COVID-19 uh, uh, protection in HVAC systems. And I am the uh, moderator for this uh, webinar and I'm the uh, chair, uh, a member of the uh, government uh, affairs uh, committees and also a, a chair chairman of the uh, one of the ad hoc committee responsible for organizing this uh, uh, webinar. And in fact, uh, I'm the regional vice chair of uh, Region 13, which is in the uh, Southeast Asia, and I come from Hong Kong chapter. So I believe that uh, many of the attendees are SRA members. So you may still remember, we start to celebrate the 125th anniversary of SRA uh, from last year in 2019. And you can see this is an overview about our society, uh, which started in 1894. And for this uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic in particular, you may uh, notice that ASHRAE uh, have uh, made response in the past few months by setting up an epidemic task force. And this is the uh, uh, some of the area that uh, this uh, task force uh, have been looking at, and uh, they have uh, researchers and also uh, practitioners in the industry that try to gather useful technical resources and information. And uh, you can find all the technical resource information from the task force and from our society on these uh, web links. And uh, some of you may also be interested in the upcoming uh, events of our society. And I have uh, picked up a few of them, uh, which highlight here on this slide, uh, including the upcoming uh, SRA 2020 virtual conference. This is the first time SRA trying to have virtual conference because of this pandemic, which will start uh, next week. And uh, among all the uh, different uh, technical sections, live section, there are four in particular related to COVID-19 that some of you may like to register for the conference and then attend or watch uh, the video recording afterwards. And at the same time, there will be uh, another uh, training short course online uh, on COVID-19 and buildings in particular for uh, reopening or reoccupation after lockdown, which will be held on the 8th of uh, July. So please uh, visit the website if you are interested uh, to attend those uh, uh, activities. So uh, as a in the, as the introduction, I would also like to highlight to you some update data. Um, you may be aware that uh, the COVID-19 is now affecting every country in the world. And this is the uh, dashboard or the uh, map uh, by uh, World Health Organizations. And you can see that uh, amongst all these uh, affected countries, some of them are what we call emerging economies, which include uh, some of the developing countries. Uh, which are now facing a bunch of uh, challenges in terms of the health uh, crisis they are facing, uh, the control of the transmission of virus in their society, and also economic impact to their society in terms of the lockdowns and uh, any kind of supply of food or medical equipment and, and so on. These are creating uh, much problems uh, in some of these uh, countries. And we believe that uh, building operation and maintenance and also the HVAC system is a critical part of uh, everyday life. So therefore, uh, uh, we would like to provide uh, in this uh, webinar and in, in also the upcoming activities, more technical information which uh, could be uh, adopted or referred to by uh, people in uh, the emerging economies or some other uh, countries. Uh, when they are considering the protection uh, and uh, health risk uh, of uh, their facilities. So this is uh, the, the list of the three topics. So at this point, I would like to pass uh, uh, to uh, our first speaker, Professor William Bamford, for the uh, uh, presentations. Bill? Thank you. Uh, hopefully you can see my screen now. Um, it's a, a real pleasure to be here at this program, an honor to be invited and uh, say good morning to everyone because it's just a few minutes after 8 a.m. Uh, where I am. 
my uh, function here on the program is to uh, give an overview of some of the background material so that the uh, presentations by the other speakers specific to uh, emerging economies uh, will have a foundation. So my talk is about fundamentals of risk management for uh, COVID-19. We'll start with uh, infectious disease transmission modes. There are a number of different ways that an infectious disease can be transmitted uh, through the air, either by large droplets over a short range or by aerosols, by smaller particles or droplets that can remain airborne for some period of time, in some cases almost indefinitely, by uh, intermediate surface contact or fomite transfer, water and food, physical contact, and also by uh, vectors such as mosquitoes. Uh, we're talking here today mainly about uh, airborne transmission in its various forms because that's what can be impacted by HVAC. Uh, HVAC can also to some extent impact fomite transmission, but for COVID-19 it's not thought to be one of the, the main modes. Uh, risk management is something that everyone should be becoming familiar with. There's a hierarchy of controls to mitigate those various uh, infection modes. Uh, elimination of sources is the most important one. If we can do it, that's hard to do with an infectious disease. Uh, engineering controls are considered to be the, the next most effective approach. If you can't eliminate the source, uh, you can deal with it with uh, HVAC systems and other <clears throat> means that intervene to reduce exposure. And then following that, there are administrative controls, rules and regulations, and personal protective equipment, which to some extent are viewed as being less effective because they depend on people actually implementing them. Uh, risk management for infection requires a team approach because there are so many different uh, factors in a building and amongst building systems that contribute to it. So where do infectious aerosols come from? Humans are the, the main source of breathing, talking, singing, coughing, sneezing. All of these activities can produce aerosols and in, in greatly uh, uh, different uh, concentrations or, or amounts. Breathing is the uh, least productive and activities like singing produce a very large amount of aerosol. As you can see in the uh, flow visualization of a, a cough there on the, the right-hand side. But we also have plumbing fixtures that can produce aerosols, uh, and you can see a, a visualization of a, a toilet also on the right. And the, additionally, medical procedures in dentist's office and in uh, hospitals where intubation might be done can produce aerosols. So there are lots of sources, and <clears throat> those are what are producing the contaminants in the air that we need to deal with. So the respiratory aerosols are uh, initially droplets that contain water, proteins, and salts, and they cover up a wide range of, of sizes, as you can see in the figure on the right, which is some, some fairly old research, but still widely cited by Dugwood in the, the US in the 1940s. So these uh, droplets dehydrate to smaller final sizes from their initial sizes, which may be as large as 1,000 microns, and many of them can remain airborne for long periods of time. There have been studies of influenza where the uh, the viral load in aerosol has been sampled that have found that uh, half of the <clears throat> viral load may be in particles smaller than five microns, which are quite capable of staying airborne for a significant period of time. So this um, uh, issue of, of the size ranges of droplets has uh, resulted in the division of of uh, airborne exposure into the close contact large droplet mode, which is what's mainly uh, talked about as the, the primary mode of infection uh, for COVID-19, at least by World Health Organization and other <clears throat> organizations. Those are droplets that are large enough that they will settle out because of their weight uh, fairly quickly within this one to two meter radius that uh, we have all heard about being the safe separation distance for di uh, distancing. But some of the large droplets can also travel a long distance if they're produced by a cough or a sneeze and they leave the uh, <clears throat> mouth and nose at high velocities. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about what is the, the difference or the dividing line between large and small. Some say as large as 60 microns initial diameter or 10 microns final diameter. Uh, whether a particle can be distributed a long distance to some extent also depends on local airflow conditions. So it's it's a bit of a gray area, but that's 
the, the distinction that we're making here between uh, close contact and aerosol. So SARS-CoV-2, the, uh, the virus that causes the, uh, the COVID-19 infection is um, very closely related to the, the SARS-1 coronavirus that caused the, uh, the SARS epidemic some years ago. It's an RNA virus that has a fatty or lipid envelope and the, the size of the virus is <clears throat> about 120 uh, nanometers or 0.12 microns. Uh, we, we often focus too much on that because given the way that viruses are shed in respiratory droplets, what's really important is the spectrum of sizes of those droplets, which are quite a bit lar larger. There are a lot of things we don't know about the disease uh, transmission that uh, would be helpful to know the, the shedding rate of a typical infected person and the infectious dose. Um, so not having that information means we're a little bit in the dark in terms of deciding exactly how much do we have to reduce airborne concentrations to control risks. That's the, the situation we're going to be in for some time. We also know that uh, in the air, the uh, virus can survive for hours and on surfaces for uh, days, according to some of the work that's been done. So there is a big controversy over whether or not there is uh, airborne or aerosol transmission uh, that's complicated by some disagreements about what those terms mean. The, the World Health Organization and CDC in the US and others are focused very heavily on close uh, contact, um, but they haven't entirely ruled out other modes as well. A lot of the evidence comes from healthcare environments, which may be well ventilated. So there's some explanations for why we may not see a lot of <clears throat> aerosol or airborne transmission. One could be that the viruses are mostly in large droplets, but that's not necessarily demonstrated by the evidence that's available. Another plausible one is the infectious dose is large. And the third is that in a lot of environments, uh, environmental factors reduce the, the concentration. Um, but there are a number of unexplained uh, community spread or super spreading events like the Skagit Valley choir rehearsal or the Guangzhou uh, restaurant case that are really hard to explain by this large droplet transfer. So uh, <clears throat> that and the evidence from the SARS epidemic suggests that maybe we do have some uh, obligate airborne transmission going on under certain circumstances. And there is a fairly large community of, uh, of physicians, engineers, aerosol scientists, epidemiologists who believe that's the case. And you may have seen some of the, uh, the papers like the one shown in on the right-hand side of uh, this slide. So ASHRAE uh, adopting what we might call the precautionary principle uh, and other organizations as well, uh, RIVA uh, in, in Europe, for example, uh, has taken the position that there is enough uh, evidence of airborne or aerosol transmission that we should take measures to protect ourselves that have the effect of reducing airborne exposure. Uh, you see on the right a, a figure that comes from an analysis of this uh, uh, restaurant case that's very famous where we had uh, little ventilation and uh, fan coil units circulating a lot of air in a part of the, the restaurant that was near an infected individual. And a number of people were infected at the three tables shown there at the top of this figure. <clears throat> so that's where ASHRAE's guidance uh, comes from. So with, with that foundation, let's uh, discuss some of the engineering controls that are available and that are the tools that we have to try to mitigate exposure. Ventilation is one of them. How much outdoor air do we provide for dilution of contaminants? Air distribution is another um, factor. How do we move air in spaces? Are there better and worse ways to mix air uh, supplied by our air conditioning systems with the air in the space that will uh, reduce likelihood of exposure? Uh, filtration, which generally is taken to mean filtration of particles, uh, another important uh, mechanism. Disinfection by various means. Uh, UV is the one that ASHRAE uh, most strongly uh, endorses, but there are others as well that you've heard of, uh, ionization and uh, dry hydrogen peroxide and, and others that are uh, being discussed as possibilities. And then also temperature and humidity control, which uh, relates to our uh, HVAC system operation as well. But, uh, those are the main things that, that we can do as those who uh, are responsible for indoor environmental control. So let's talk about 
uh, each of these a little bit. Uh, ventilation dilutes contaminants and by doing so increases the exposure time that's required to acquire infectious dose. Uh, becoming infected with a respiratory illness is somewhat like being exposed to a toxin. There's a certain amount of infectious material that we have to inhale before we have a high probability of an infection incurring. So if we lower the concentration and our breathing rate doesn't change, it takes longer time and that's protective. <clears throat> so ventilation works quite effectively, but it's energy intensive, even if we have energy recovery. Uh, we see the impact of ventilation in the figure from a study done in a, a university in uh, China some years ago where they were looking at another coronavirus, but the one that causes the common cold. And you can see there a very clear relationship between the ventilation rate in these dormitories and the incidence of colds. So we, we know that it's uh, generally effective, but it, uh, it does have a, a negative to it in terms of energy and maybe even in terms of feasibility for some systems. Uh, ventilation works in conjunction with exhaust, with removing uh, contaminated air locally and pressurization to uh, have flow from uh, clean to less clean spaces uh, as a strategy for controlling risk. Uh, air distribution can contribute if we have strong air currents that distribute uh, larger droplets beyond the range that they would normally uh, be a, a high risk factor. So if we have, for example, pedestal fans or personal fans that are in the breathing zone, or if we have a lot of unitary uh, air conditioning equipment that produces high velocities, that has the potential to distribute the larger uh, size droplets in, in that respiratory aerosol over a longer uh, distance. The lower velocity mixing may actually be preferable to displacement ventilation because displacement produces uh, hot spots near infected individuals. And I've, I've seen some persuasive discussion amongst aerosol scientists that, that mixing is actually useful in some cases. Uh, personalized ventilation and exhaust can work if you can localize uh, the sources or the uh, individuals that you want to protect. The filtration is capable of, of removing uh, with some degree of efficiency any aerosol contaminant, but uh, not all of any size. Uh, for indoor sources, filtration is only effective if we have recirculation either within the space or within the system, so it, it somewhat uh, conflicts with guidance that you may have seen to uh, eliminate recirculation in systems that were designed to recirculate. Uh, it works well if the contaminants of concern are airborne. They aren't always. They may be on surfaces and resuspended uh, by disturbances. Um, and it also is effective if the clean air delivery rate, the uh, volume of filtered air that we're supplying is uh, large enough to dilute the contaminant concentration in the space to a, a safe level. We see a uh, MERV filter curve example there on the right-hand side in this figure, of the, the ASHRAE standard 52.2 system. Uh, we are at very low filter efficiencies by minimum standards currently, and one of the things in our guidance is to increase efficiency. So here we see some uh, data on uh, respiratory aerosols over on the, uh, the right-hand side, some work done by Christopher Chow from Hong Kong and others that shows the distribution of the, uh, the droplets produced by uh, speaking and coughing. And you can see that those are in a size range that uh, much of it could remain airborne and uh, could be filterable. And at the lower right, we see some data from the current epidemic that shows the presence of uh, virus in droplets of small sizes. You notice that the scale on these three figures only goes uh, up to, uh, I think it's uh, about five uh, microns here. So there's quite a bit of particulate matter containing viruses that are uh, capable of staying airborne and of being filtered if we have filters of appropriate efficiency. This figure comes from uh, an interesting economic analysis by uh, Professor Brent Stevens from the US and uh, it uses the Wells-Riley model of infection. What we see here is that the uh, uh, mean relative risk of infection on the, uh, the vertical axis can be affected by filtration, the, the heavy black line, or by ventilation. 
And that as we go from lower filter efficiencies, smaller MERV numbers to larger ones, we get a significant reduction in uh, infection risk with not much change in the annual cost. This is dollars per year for a 5,000 square foot or 500 meter squared office building. The colored curves show the cost of doing the same thing using ventilation. And you can see that in every case to get to the same level that a MERV filter achieves, it takes a lot more uh, cost to do it. And that's going to be mainly energy costs. So not only the, the operating cost, but the energy use of the building is going to be going up. <clears throat> Another reason that increasing filter efficiency may be a good thing is shown here. The effects of PM 2.5 on health in general, exclusive of infectious diseases, is well known. Uh, World Health Organization has published studies about that. And we can see in the figure on the left here that if we go from uh, a MERV 6 or 8 filter where our ASHRAE standard 62.1 and 62.2 are currently to 13 and 14, which is the range that's being recommended for pandemic response, we can get uh, on average predicted hundreds of dollars per person per year increase in health benefits by reducing morbidity and mortality. So that's a, a no regrets reason for increasing filter efficiency. Now let's talk about uh, air disinfection, and in the interest of time, I'll focus on uh, UV light, germicidal light here. Uh, ultraviolet light in, in the UVC band has been known for more than 100 years to uh, be a disinfectant, and we have a well-developed and relatively inexpensive technology in mercury vapor lamps that produces 254 nanometer uh, <clears throat> ultraviolet which as you can see in the figure at the bottom right is close to the maximum germicidal effectiveness of, of UVC. It's perhaps at 90% uh, uh, of the peak effectiveness at 265. Uh, germicidal UV works by disrupting the bonds in DNA or RNA. You can see a thymine dimer in the upper right figure formed by <coughs> adenine thymine bonds being broken by photons of UV light. Enough of that damage prevents viral or uh, bacterial replication, which is how it disinfects. Uh, coronaviruses actually have very good UV susceptibility, so it's an excellent technology to apply as an adjunct to filtration and ventilation. And it's been approved by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the US as an adjunct for tuberculosis control. So it's been well vetted by agencies of that sort. There's some interesting emerging technologies like uh, LEDs at different wavelengths and uh, far ultraviolet uh, <clears throat> from krypton chlorine excimer lamps. The benefit of some of these technologies that are being studied is that perhaps they are safe for human exposure. 254 nanometer uh, UV light needs to be kept away from occupants of spaces. This slide shows some typical applications. We can do upper air UVGI is shown on the top of the, the figure. On the left, we see some fix, fixtures on the wall of a large open space break room or something of that sort. And they're creating a disinfection zone as shown in the figure on the upper right, uh, where there is a significant uh, UV fluence and air that moves into that uh, <clears throat> zone by uh, being carried by thermal plumes or by the air distribution of an HVAC system can be disinfected and then reintroduced into the space with uh, an effect that can be the equivalent of 10, 20, 30 air changes per hour, depending on how effectively the system is designed. <clears throat> Another place to put UV is in air handling units, and you can do surface disinfection of cooling coils to improve their performance, but also with sufficient intensity, this can also do air disinfection. And another use is space disinfection with uh, devices like the UV uh, robot, so-called, on the lower right that can be wheeled into an unoccupied space and used to disinfect it uh, between uses. So there's some interesting trade-offs between ventilation, filtration, and air cleaning. Um, these can be uh, described by the, the air cleaner effectiveness parameter shown on the, the right in this slide. It's essentially a measure that will tell us what is the incremental benefit from putting um, another control into a space. <clears throat> so we're going to a start, we assume, with some level of, of ventilation because it's required by code, um, but then we'll have some filtration and we may add a, uh, uh, an air disinfection device to that. Uh, some of these things are, are synergistic, they're additive, as if we had ventilation that put filtration in the space. But if we have uh, ventilation that's increased by recirculation and that reduces the flow of recirculated air through a filter, there's actually a trade-off. 
And so I did a little example just to illustrate this, a, a very simple recirculating system with uh, outside air and a filter in it. And I looked at what happened if we uh, kept the outside air constant and increased the filter efficiency and what happens if we keep the filter efficiency constant and increase the outside air. And that's shown in, in these two figures. So if we have a 20% uh, uh, outside air system and we have a filter uh, efficiency that increases from uh, zero to 100%, essentially from no filter to HEPA level, what we see is that the effectiveness of the filter goes from zero initially up to 100% <clears throat> as we uh, increase its performance. And the normalized concentration, the ratio of the concentration in the space to what it was with no filter uh, drops to 20% of what it was without the filter. So there we have a, an additive effect for putting a better filter in. On the other hand, on the right-hand side, if we start with a 60% filter, maybe in the, in the MERV 13 range on average, and we increase the outside air, what we see is that the uh, concentration, again, drops to 20 percent as the outsider increases, but the effectiveness of the filter eventually goes to zero because when there's no recirculation through it, it's not removing any contaminants from the space. So uh, we've increased the outside air here by a factor of five, and we've only achieved the same reduction in concentration that we got by putting in a better filter with the same uh, outside air that we had initially, which uh, to me somewhat throws a uh, no recirculation recommendation for recirculating systems into a bit of doubt. So they need to be considered very carefully if you're thinking about doing that. So those are our, uh, our interventions um, that relate to changing the, our normal air uh, contaminant controls. Uh, I'm sure that most have heard about the potential for temperature and humidity control to be effective in reducing risk. ASHRAE has actually had in its handbook in the humidifier section for many years, the uh, a version of the figure shown on the right that suggests that uh, perhaps 40 to 60% relative humidity is the right range to be in to protect ourselves from a number of uh, indoor air quality risks, everything from infectious disease to uh, chemical exposures. There have been some recent studies that have considered this uh, issue, and they have shown that specifically for uh, viral infections, this also seems to be a, a highly protective region, that uh, uh, there are a number of factors that reduce risk that are shown at the bottom of the slide there, that uh, droplets uh, evaporate more slowly and settle out faster when humidity is higher, that uh, our mucosa are less receptive to infection when the air is not too dry, and that the viruses themselves may be uh, less infective and survive less long when the humidity is not too low. This is a pretty strong argument for at least setting some uh, feasible floor on relative humidity. There are good reasons not to exceed 60 that have to do with other factors. Uh, so ASHRAE has not uh, come out uh, unequivocally uh, in uh, endorsing that recommendation because there are some concerns about it. Uh, different pathogens respond differently. Uh, there's the risk of moisture damage and mold growth if the humidity is high, or even if it's low in some climates, in cold climates, even uh, perhaps 30% relative humidity in an existing building would be difficult to attain without having problems with the envelope. Uh, the effectiveness of UVGI is reduced somewhat, but that's probably a secondary factor. And of course, there's potentially comfort issues as well. Um, so ASHRAE says, uh, look at this. Others like Riva have said, we don't think you need to change any set points from what they already are. So it's a, it's a bit of a contentious issue. So those are things that we can do with our HVAC systems. But at, at the end here, I want to loop back and, and remind everyone that uh, ASHRAE agrees with the, the health authorities that say that uh, close contact is clearly the, uh, the highest uh, component of risk and that we need to do the things that we need to do to reduce that risk, which includes masks. Uh, masks can vary from uh, N95s that protect the wearer if they're fitted properly to cloth masks that mainly protect others. So in, in one case, uh, uh, PPE is, uh, or a mask is PPE, but in others it might be a source control or engineering control. You can see the effect of a cloth mask in the figure 
on the right there that was produced by a researcher at NIST that shows that it uh, greatly uh, reduces the uh, extent of the, the jet that's produced by a cough. So it's a good thing for us to wear our masks. And uh, this figure from a recent paper that was published uh, analyzing the effectiveness of masks shows that uh, if even if we have uh, just simple cloth masks that block particles being uh, expelled by coughing and sneezing and other activities. And if a lot of people do it uh, with a moderate amount of adherence and uh, moderate efficacy, we can get the R naught for uh, uh, COVID-19 down to one, which would be the tipping point for stopping the, the pandemic. So that's a really important thing to keep in mind. It's not all about uh, personal behavior or all about HVAC. We need to do all of these things to be safe. So to summarize, uh, the HVAC system interventions we can do are mainly reducing this uh, residual risk of aerosol and airborne transmission that may occur in some cases. Uh, we've got a fairly small but uh, very effective repertoire of controls we can apply. We need to do that in a, a thoughtful way, taking into consideration our climate and the systems we have and the other factors that may be in play. Uh, and engineering controls, again, are just part of an overall uh, risk management program, so do the other things as well. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention and I'll conclude. Thanks. Hello, uh, the next section, this is Luke Leung. The next session will be commercial building. So there will be three elements we're going to talk about, the environment, the space, and the systems. So environment. So summer's coming in a few days. So it's a good time to go outdoor. And the good news here is, according to this paper, um, majority of the cases that people trans, uh, got infected by the COVID-19 is actually indoor. They did a study of over 7,300 cases, and they find only two cases are outdoor. So one of the things about commercial building may be have the tenants to spend more time outdoor during lunchtime, maybe even have some meetings outdoor. Under sunshine in the summer is good. This is a study done by U.S. Biodefense Department. And what you'll find on the top here is 90% reduction from in the air from 200 minutes to 4.5 minutes if the material is in the air. And the bottom there, what you see is on stainless steel, and they find um, over 60 minutes, there's no significant, de no significant decay if it's, it's darkness. But under sun, strong sunlight, 90% reduction in seven minutes. So the, the idea is having, out, uh, having able to go outdoor with sunshine, sunshine, sunshine is a good thing. Now, but be, be aware of the PM 2.5. There's association of higher, higher level PM 2.5 with a death rate of COVID. And this is maybe more important in some emerging country where the air quality uh, has to be a little bit of a concern there. Bill talk about the relative humidity of 40 to 60 percent, and we have to take care that it doesn't it doesn't condensate indoor, especially in the winter time. What you're seeing the bottom with additional information is actually provided by the Biodefense Department of US. We did a curve fitting of the data they provide, provide us, and what you see is roughly about 70, 60% or so. This is specific to SARS-CoV-2. It does looks like it reacts to the relative humidity at its bottoming, bottom, bottoming around that 60% area. Uh, Cold environment is not is not a uh, not as good for us because the virus tend to stay longer 
uh, stay more stable in the cold environment. So in office environment, what you want to think about is, for example, you have refrigerator or places that are colder and drier. You may want to be more concerned about that. This is a recent study indicating the importance of the floor, which is not surprising. This study is about patient room, and they find the most material on the floor. Uh, thinking about this is a droplet transmitted disease primarily, so it shouldn't be surprised that there are elements on the floor. So think about how we're going to clean the floor and don't we suspend the elements. As we know, normal carpets tend to hold a lot more dust and elements of different sizes. So, so far we roughly talk about the environment in terms of outdoor and indoor. What are the elements that, that we want to think about? The next section we touch on the spaces. This is from CDC suggesting no matter in what space, her view talk about the importance of having protection devices. CDC mentioned that all employees should wear a cloth face covering to cover their nose and mouth in all areas of the business. Coming into the lobby, this is actually our own office uh, in Shanghai. And it's not uncommon that you will see in some area of the world they have actually this uh, infrared detection device to make sure your temperature is not high. Now, you probably heard a lot of these people are asymptomatic. So what's the point of having this device here? Usually, those asymptomatic people can carry the virus, but the people who are symptomatic tend to be much stronger in, in factor of the others. So having, a, having an infrared device to identify the people that, are, that have high temperature does you know, identify those people that are you know, already symptomatic and may be more, more dangerous compared to the asymptomatic people. Some even have device like this. A Bill mentioned toilet. In this case, again, it's the patient room study. They did find the elements in the toilet, so we need to be a little bit careful about dealing with the toilet, including the continuous exhaust of the toilet and also um, whole door open. There are devices out there right now to tell you how to keep social distancing inside the toilet and make sure you know how many toilet, how many people are inside the toilet before you enter. But the good news may be a little bit of good news here is this case you might have seen in the past is the Korea World uh, Call Center. The good thing about it is there's an infection outbreak in the building, but majority of the cases, actually 94 of them out of 97 are set in the same floor. And they actually more concentrated in one area of the floor. So Obviously, they share the toilet, they share the elevator, they share the amenities in the building, but we didn't see the entire building get infected. In fact, the cases, are, majority of the cases are concentrated in the corner. That's a, that suggests maybe droplet is actually a very important element in this transmission. Now, if your building has atrium, you got to be a little bit more careful because the air tend to be shared. So whatever measure you take at one floor, it has to be somewhat consistent to the other floor to achieve a overall sort of um, measures in the building. So we touched the spaces from the lobby to the toilet to the atrium, some of the things you worry about. Now the final section here, we will talk about the systems in the building. Um, if your building has natural ventilation, it will be helpful. Uh, what you can see in the screen here is the natural ventilation of a building. And moving into the different system in the building, if you have a radiant system, that doesn't recirculate air, just pump fresh air into the building. That's obviously good. And you can leave them continue to, continue to run, same as tube beam. 
So there's tools out there to model this system. In this case, we actually model a DOA system uh, using the NIST latest software. So what you're seeing on the screen, the blue is actually the occupancy. Every hour, the person spent 10 minutes inside the room, right? So, and the room has a emission in there. So he's not constantly exposed to it. So every 10 minutes on the hour. And the green line is the, um, and the green line is actually the total exposure of the day, and the blue line is the uh, exposure concentration. You can see as the as the day go go by, the integrated exposure is higher. And we'll come back to this chart later to compare to different system. Now there's another types of doors that recirculate air. For example, you have a DOA, so you have a fan core unit or VRF in the space. This type of DOA system, we have to be a little bit careful. Bill mentioned the restaurant in China. In that case, there's a person, A1 is infected, but he's asymptomatic. And then he actually spread the virus onto the other people inside the restaurant because the airflow uh, enhanced the distance of the of the transfer. So the point here is if you have a VRF system with no filtering, no outside air, and tend to recirculate air, make sure you understand the airflow that it doesn't carry from one person to the other for a prolonged period of time. And then, of course, there are VAV system. In the case of VAV system, this is a VAV system with minimum outside air. And they tend to return air back to the unit. Now, in this case, if you have an enhanced filter like MER13, it will help to minimize the amount of material in the air. We will touch on this graph here. So what you are seeing is MERV 8 and the benefit of MERV 13 using 0.12 micrometer elements. So in this chart here, what you are seeing is we are comparing using the NIST program, comparing MERV 8 to MERV 13. So what you see is the integrated exposure is almost after a 24 hour stay um, is almost maybe slightly more uh, slightly more than half, but it's a lot better using the MERV 13 compared to the MERV 8. And the exposure concentration is also better have a MERV 13 filter compared to a MERV 8 filter. So if your VAV system has 100% outside air, what you can also do is shut off the return and provide 100% fresh air into the space. Now, what you are seeing here is comparing MERV 8 to 100% outside air. Again, you will see the integrated exposure and the exposure concentration is also, also much better with the VAV. Uh, with 100% outside air. So how about we comparing all three? VAV with MERV 8 compared to VAV with MERV 13 compared to VAV with 100% outside air. Now Bill made the point earlier that uh, we have to be a little bit careful when use 100% outside air. You can see here why because the VAV with MER13, the benefit is actually very close to the VAV with 100% outside air. In this case, the VAV with 100% outside air may be slightly better, but not by a whole lot. Um, so they are very close to each other, but MER13 is doing much of the job already. And they are both VAV with MER13 or VAV with 100% outside air still significantly better than a VAV with MER8. So there may be another discussion out there you hear is how about DOAS compared to VAV system. So this is a case of using DOAS compared to VAV system. Now in this case with the 
whole day's exposure, the VAV with MERV 8 and VAV with MERV 13 actually is slightly better. And the reason is because they continuously recirculate the air through a much higher grade filter. Now, but this is only one case, of course, so we have to be a little bit careful, but there are certainly cases that indicate um, the, the VAV system can potentially be better because they're recirculating everything, as, as, especially in the lower case through a MERV-13 filter. So, um, but then you have to, this is, average in the room, so we have to also think about what about close distances and all that information. So when we look at these numbers here, we, we have to be bear in mind that this is kind of the average of the room, not a specific location. UVC light is important and we can, and Bill went through that a lot already, that's something that we can use to enhance the room. And there are also a bunch of emergent, emergent um, technology we can use in our buildings but this may need a little bit more science to completely understand what exactly can they do. Moving beyond the COVID-19, so there are actually other elements that can derail our health in the future. Pandemic is number three, according to World Health Organization. Chronic diseases is number two, and Climate change is actually number one. Those are the top three elements that can derail our, our future in terms of our health. But the good news there is maybe we can look for the highest common multiple. For example, the particulates in the air, we, if we have good filter, we can, we can help in pandemic. We can help to improve the air quality uh, to avoid the PM 2.5 of chronic diseases or avoid some of the fire and these particulars that come into our building. So maybe one element we can start thinking about is what are these highest common multiple that can do multiple things that can keep our buildings healthier in the future. Thank you. Thank you. I would again thank the organizers of this uh, webinar to have invited me to speak about uh, the residential buildings in this case. We heard from Bill about the fundamentals of uh, COVID-19 and uh, some of the basic uh, understanding that we need to have about the virus and its transmission modes. And Luke has uh, taken us through all the issues and what we could do with commercial buildings. And I would like to spend some time, the rest of the time in this webinar um, on uh, the residential buildings. So I'm gonna just start off with this uh, slide that Bill had showed right uh, in his early part of the presentation. If you look at the um, infection control hierarchy, uh, obviously, right at the top, if you can eliminate the pathogen, that's ideal. Uh, then we go down the line, down the pyramid, so to speak, down to the personal protection equipment. Um, again, the focus, even in terms of the residential buildings, would be on engineering controls. So again, the talk that I'm going to have with you for the next few minutes will be on what sort of things do we know about existing residential building situation? Uh, I'm going to sort of take you through with information that we currently know about the ventilation rates and uh, what sort of exposure levels that are likely to occur, not just in terms of the uh, viral infectious aerosols, but generally in terms of uh, any contaminant inside. We've seen this before in, uh, I believe it is Bill's uh, slides, and it was also reiterated when Luke was talking about, uh, we look at ventilation as being one of the uh, primary means of achieving dilution of indoor contaminants. Uh, of course, there are other ways you remove the source and that's even better, but let's look at ventilation as the uh, means of dilution of indoor contaminants. Three things come to mind and we need to bear in mind. 
that is the quality of the outdoor air and and here we are talking about uh, what sort of uh, uh, quality of the outdoor air that we can bring in depending on where you are this might be very different might change the quantity the liters per second or, or cfm per person uh, that we need to provide as part of the amount of uh, outdoor air that we need to uh, bring into the uh, building then we have one of the important consideration that's the room air distribution the ventilation effectiveness as the uh, primary characteristic that drives this understanding of how the room air is distributed and if we are talking about outdoor air that comes in for dilution of indoor contaminants how do we make use of what we understand and what we know about room air distribution to help achieve a better effectiveness at the breathing zone and thereby help in mitigating the exposure to uh, contaminants of whatever nature they are. Um, I'm going to take you through, as I said, some uh, data that we know from literature, some uh, studies that have been done. And if we look at uh, this particular case, I'll start off with uh, a semi-detached house in the heating season, and this is natural ventilation. Um, in a house that has uh, trickle vents on windows and doors. So these are little openings that you can either open or keep closed on windows and doors that will allow, depending on the wind direction, uh, outside air to come into the building. So here is a, a very summarized slide that uh, is part of a publication that uh, um, is currently under review for a journal. And what you're seeing here is carbon dioxide concentration measured in a bedroom, in this particular case, in that, in that house that I just showed you earlier, over time. You see a clear buildup of uh, the uh, contaminant, the, the carbon dioxide in the bedroom, and it goes from something like 2,200 ppm to about almost 3,000 ppm uh, overnight. And it's just with one person sleeping in the in the bedroom and the bedroom door being closed and then the person leaves and this was an experiment that was conducted and you have a, a, a decay of the carbon dioxide simply because you've got outside air that comes in through the natural ventilation process and that's happening to the trickle vents in the bedroom windows and it was further augmented sometime later by uh, having the bedroom door fully open now look what's happening between c and e you have a tremendous difference in the air change rate that is obtained in the same bedroom. Keeping the door open is very good. It helps to dilute the bedroom contaminants. So even if you're talking about rooms within a house and the type of spaces that you'll be spending more time, like in a bedroom in the night and that sort of spaces, keeping the door open in a naturally ventilated building or a house appears to be much better than keep, keeping the door closed. And then if you can augment that further with exhaust ventilation, so you've got a bathroom exhaust that gets turned on, or you have a kitchen hood that's also turned on at an appropriate uh, time, then you notice that the air change rate improves even better. So this is just to give you an idea that natural ventilation by itself will not be very effective unless we are able to direct that air into the house, either by proper openings on different sides, facades of the house, or augmenting that with more, um, uh, uh, assisted with better extraction through uh, bathroom exhaust fans or kitchen hood extract. Um, I'm gonna take you through another example, this time in a, tropical setting, typical setting that a lot of us uh, in, in, in Asia would be familiar with. You've got a, uh, an apartment, a high-rise apartment, where you have uh, a lot of uh, multi-split system fan call units. These are split system units, basically, DX, uh, direct expansion driven. And if you look at this particular slide, this is a, 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 an apartment uh, master bedroom where you have the opportunity to make use of an exhaust fan that is fitted in the bathroom window. So this slide is something that uh, I, I, I like to discuss. It's again part of something that we did quite some years back. 
Um, and what you see here is uh, the measured CO2 level on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. Uh, there are two parts to this experiment that you're seeing here. The first part is about a very focused experiment where we had people occupying that uh, bedroom just to provide carbon dioxide as a, a buildup of uh, tracer gas, if you like. So they offered whatever CO2 buildup could occur, and then they left. So the, uh, the four adults, they left, and as soon as they leave, you notice that um, uh, there, there is a sort of a drop in the um, uh, CO2 decay, and that's happening because uh, we did two things. We did one where there was no exhaust fan in operation, and then another experiment with the exhaust fan in operation. With the fan on, you find the ACH, the air change per hour is about 1.96, almost two. The other one is uh, uh, one sixth, uh, it's, it's about 0.32. So clearly having an extraction, we know from first principles, from our understanding, it would help. And here is a case where it was clearly proven. Now we take it further as an experiment into the night, uh, the, the entire night as an experimental duration. We notice here that when, when, when it was occupied by two adults and a child. The buildup, uh, probably in about six to seven hours, it reaches about 3,000 ppm. And that is not uh, unusual. A lot of these buildings do have a fair amount of air tightness because the buildings are being increasingly made airtight from energy consideration, which is a good thing to have. But it also leads to um, buildup of contaminants, and in this case, CO2 as, uh, as an indicator that we are looking at. And notice again, when the exhaust fan is uh, switched on, the decay occurs quite rapidly. So the benefit of having an extraction provided in the bedroom or in the house itself, like in the previous case that we saw uh, in, the, in, the, in the heating season situation, it helps. So two examples, one from heating season, one from cooling season, is just to lay the background that we need to understand what's happening in naturally ventilated residential buildings. And especially when we start to enclose them and start using other means of environmental control for thermal comfort. Um, a quick uh, kind of brush overview of uh, the standard, standard 62.2. Most of you would be quite familiar with it. Depending on the uh, floor area, the dwelling floor area and the number of bedrooms are dwelling, we have the ventilation rate in terms of liters per second on this slide. And it is very clear in a, for any given uh, area, dwelling floor area, if you have more number of bedrooms, you need to provide more ventilation. And that's understandable because when you have more bedrooms and you're gonna sort of close some of the doors, you wanna be able to make sure that there's at least some ventilation that can reach different parts of the uh, dwelling. So this is just to give you uh, an overview of how the ventilation rate is provided as a provision in the standard. Um, if we look at the uh, European standard, the SEN standard 16798, uh, 2019 version, what you're seeing here is the design delta CO2. That means the CO2 level above the outdoors. And if you take the outdoors as about 400 ppm, so this is telling you how much more above that you can have in the house and uh, the European standard has both uh, the, the living rooms as well as the bedrooms. And you notice here that the bedroom requirement is a little bit more stringent. In other words, you need to actually have a better ventilation provision uh, in the bedrooms in order to be able to keep those CO2 levels lower. Um, SEN standard also has extraction airflow rates, the sort of thing that we discussed earlier for exhaust uh, ventilation. And again, you notice here, depending on the number of rooms and whether you have a kitchen exhaust, your bathroom exhaust, other wet areas, uh, toilet, there's one in dwelling or two or more in dwelling, you need to be providing uh, uh, a certain amount of extraction rate in liters per second. And that's what uh, this slide gives you as an overview. Uh, I'm going to run through the next few slides uh, as, a, as a sort of a broad, literature review based overview of what is it that people have studied in the past, in the last, shall we say, 15, 20 years, perhaps. Uh, the x-axis here are different uh, references, different literature uh, reports or 
pub journal publications, let me be more clear on that, and the x-axis or y-axis in this case is the CO2 level. So the idea that I want to portray here is what sort of CO2 levels have been measured and reported in these studies and you have the triangles tell you the red one is the maximum and the green one is the minimum and the circle, uh, the blue circle tells you the maximum of mean and the one, the, uh, the one with the uh, uh, circle and the cross that's telling you the mean. So you got the, let's look at the mean values to see if you can get some general idea of what's going on. The 780 and the 1350 line that you see here, this comes from the European standard because the European standard does provide CO2 sort of a, a number that we can look at when it comes to residential buildings as I was showing you in an earlier slide. So you got cooling season and heating season. The left is cooling season, the right is heating season, and this is naturally ventilated buildings. And there's several studies reported. And you notice that the um, main CO2 values um, uh, are generally lower in the cooling season um, and also in the heating season perhaps, but then you, you in, in naturally ventilated buildings, you got more of them probably in, uh, in, in sort of le levels that are below the 1350 ppm of course you do have some where it exceeds that no doubt about it this is the mechanically ventilated buildings it's also equally good because when you have mechanically ventilated buildings you would uh, find that uh, uh, there's a clear provision mechanical provision of bringing the outdoor air into the uh, rooms into the bedrooms we are specifically looking at the bedroom situation here that's what this uh, overview uh, study was done about and again, you notice here that the mean values are much, much lower than the earlier case with the naturally ventilated buildings. So the MV, as we would expect with the mechanical uh, ventilation, makes things much better. Uh, we now look at the air change rates. Now, notice that the air change rates, um, again, as a comparison points, I've got uh, the pink numbers, 0 0.2 and 0 0.7, that's coming from uh, some kind of uh, estimate based on the ASHRAE provisions in terms of how much ventilation we need to provide. So 0 0.2 is on the lower side and 0 0.7 is on the, on the upper side. That's kind of a range within which all those different dwelling areas and number of bedroom based ventilation rates comes to. And the, and the purple or blue lines, blue numbers that you want to call, the 0 0.4 air change per hour to 0 0.7, that comes from the European standard, the SEN standard. Now you also see something above on this plot, that's the orange numbers, the 2.92 and the 1.2. This is for the bedrooms. Now the European standard, the sense, uh, sense standard, um, actually talks about air change provisions for bedrooms in addition to what uh, they mentioned about the whole house. So you notice here that for bedrooms, the requirement is much higher. And that's simply because you want to be able to maintain a much lower CO2 level. In other words, have a better ventilation provision in the bedrooms. So the three numbers that you see for the Europeans, the higher air change is for the category one building. This is the, 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 the best class, best in class building. And then you have two and the 1.2 sort of thing that's uh, gradually decreasing in terms of how you look at them as, as class of buildings. So if you look at the bedroom ventilation, you, you notice here in terms of air change per hour, uh, pretty much most of the studies reported uh, don't get there. And, and they are quite low compared to what you would expect based on the European standard. But then again, if you start looking at uh, what is generally seen for naturally ventilated buildings, something like 0 0.5, 0 0.6 air change per hour, uh, in the heating season, you notice that a lot of the means are about that number or slightly you know uh, within that number so there's a lot more that one could expect to accomplish in naturally ventilated settings in heating season especially and also in cooling season if you look at it uh, there's a lot of the means that occur in the uh, line above the 0 0.7 even and that's that's probably because in the cooling season or in the, in, in the tropical settings the more warmer settings you're probably going to have more of your windows and doors open in the house so you have you help to uh, you, you aim to achieve a good cross ventilation through the different rooms and in the house or in the apartment mechanically ventilated uh, again you notice here that um, uh, in the heating season a lot of them are much lower the means are lower and if you have um, 
the you know cooling season the mean the mean seem to be slightly in fact most of the means are uh, mean, mean values in terms of acr the air change rate are are, are are much better so comparing between the seasons one would one would want to think that in the cooling season you probably go, you're probably diluting or flushing your house more frequently more often uh in comparison to what might be happening in heating season situation i've got two more slides in this point of discussion which is the air change rate in the whole dwelling earlier we were looking at the bedrooms and now if you look at the dwelling the whole house uh, as as a whole and then here you find that uh, comparing with similar lines uh the Pink ones are the ash ray, 62.2 base numbers, uh, estimated air change rate numbers, and the purple ones are the European standard, as I mentioned earlier. Um, again, in the heating season, you notice that not, not, not all the studies reported ACRs that were even hitting that uh, sort of uh, 0 0.5 sort of number that at least we would want to expect to achieve. Um, and in the cooling season, it, it turns out to be uh, uh, somewhat better, in fact, considerably better in, in some of the studies reported. And that's uh, in mechanically ventilated buildings. Uh, again, you find uh, sort of means within uh, about 0 0.4, 0 0.5 in the heating season and in the cooling season, uh, obviously it's, it's, it's just been better. Um, with, with this sort of an overview based on the literature information about what we see in buildings, in residential buildings, in terms of the reported air change rate and also the buildup of CO2, which can be used as an indicator of how good the ventilation is, uh, we get an idea that um, in a lot of residential buildings, unless we make a concerted effort in ensuring that we have air to come into the building either through mechanical ventilation, good amount of mechanical ventilation, or if it's naturally ventilated buildings, air them enough, open the windows enough, or if we have other means to ensure that you have a good cross ventilation, uh, we, we may not actually be able to get ventilation as main uh, means of achieving dilution, so which is something that is important and we need to be uh, mindful of. So I'm going to sort of go towards the end of uh, what I am talking about. Uh, I okay. I I wanted to go through the ASHRAE COVID-19 preparedness uh, website just to give you a little bit of a flavor of what you can see there on the residential um, building side. And here, if you notice, um, we have on the website on the ASHRAE website, you've got uh, uh, general guidance applicable to all homes. And something that I uh, mentioned in, in, in different uh, kind of aspects as we went through the presentation, maintain normal thermal comfort conditions, increase the ventilation rate. And I think that's something that we should be uh, hoping to achieve through some uh, uh, concerted effort. Operate the exhaust fans, and that was very clear when we saw the benefit in some of the case studies I reported, I showed you earlier. Uh, I probably didn't talk about specifically on the air cleaners part, and that's something we can look at and we should be looking at if we don't have ventilation in the house or in the specific room, uh, we would have to look at uh, a standalone air cleaners that can help to achieve and clean the air within that room so that if you have a, a sort of a recirculation happening within that room, you, you keep uh, the air quality in some level of reasonable uh, control. Uh, increase room air motion. Uh, this is something that we need to be uh, mindful of and ensure that we have good circulation of air movement. This also helps in achieving thermal comfort, so something that we need to be bearing in mind. Uh, there are additional guidance for homes with forced air systems. We're talking about high efficiency filters, was spoken about earlier, both by Bill and Luke as well. Uh, operate system continuously. Bill spoke about UV GI radiation systems. Uh, something that will help and that can be part of uh, uh, systems that, that are used in uh, buildings, residential buildings as well. Multifamily homes, um, specific uh, recommendation or guidance, uh, water seal in the plumbing systems in the bathrooms and toilets, uh, important consideration, maintain pressurization. And again, depending on how we want to maintain the pressurization, you want to keep a building in, in, in pressurization or you want to keep it in isolation, depending on what the situation might be. There are some clear direction and guidance provided 
And I would, I would urge uh, uh, participants and I would do, urge those who are interested to also go and look at the ASHRAE Residences FAQ question. We got 21 questions posted on this site as of now. I am part of the Residences residential team. And this is something that we regularly meet and discuss and um, try to provide up, updated information about how one could handle in the present situation specific to the residential buildings. So in conclusion, let me just uh, say a few remarks here. Uh, I, I discussed with you the principles of ventilation in terms of uh, uh, what happens in, uh, in the heating season, what happens in the cooling season, and some of the measured data uh, in terms of CO2 and the air change rate, which gives us a good indication of the type of ventilation that we have in these type of buildings, in these type of climates. Um, ventilation in residential buildings, like a review of uh, literature studies, several studies that have been done, and I've tried to uh, pull them together and put them in the context of naturally ventilated and mechanically ventilated buildings and in different climates, heating and cooling season, to give us a sense. And I think what emerged from there is in heating season, uh, the naturally ventilated uh, buildings uh, may, may not really reach up to the level of um, air change per hour that uh, we might want to achieve at least. Uh, in some cases it does, but in some cases it probably doesn't and unless a concerted effort is done through some means of directed targeted ventilation air to come into the into the house or into the bedroom and so on. In cooling season, if we keep the windows and doors open in the house, we are probably able to achieve better air change per hour. Uh, as you saw in the review of the slide, slides, um, more of the cooling season studies, the mean values were generally better as compared to the heating season studies. Uh, but if we close those uh, ven naturally ventilated environments in a uh, cooling season in a tropical climate and we use air conditioning, which just recirculates the air, then we do have an issue where we need to be mindful of that and go towards some kind of regular periodic uh, airing and, and flushing of indoor contaminants. Very briefly, I took you through the residential IAQ guide on the ASHRAE website, and we would have you would you would find more information in terms of specific questions on the FAQ part on the residential side on the same website. With that, I will conclude my presentation and thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Shantra, for the. Uh very good information. And now we have uh, finished all the three presentations <clears throat> and uh, we are going to go into the uh, Q&A sections. So uh, I would also like to uh, thank all the three speakers for the excellent time control so that we have uh, about 10 minutes left for this uh, Q&A. So for the Q&A part, uh, what I would like to do is uh, uh, we will show our faces of the speakers and I'm trying to show my face as well. Uh, let me share my uh, screen. Okay. So in fact, uh, we have uh, received um, some questions already. Uh, from the registration forms, and I have the advantage of um, a red food or the registration form and find out that there are some really good questions that have been raised by the um, audience. So I have I would like to uh, make use of those questions uh, to um, ask uh, the uh, speakers uh, for the response. And these are uh, there are three sets of questions that uh, we have selected. But the first set is related to the use of UV light. HEPA filters and ionization in HVAC systems. And there are uh, uh, three sub questions actually come from Peru, which is trying to ask about the use of UVC spectrum in air conditioning systems. And the second one uh, uh, is from uh, India, which asks about uh, HEPA filters will it uh, help to remove uh, coronavirus. And the last one uh, on, on this set is a from uh, Spain in Europe, which asks about why uh, ASHRAE is not so interested in ionization technology as compared with uh, UVGI as mentioned by Bill. Uh, for this uh, part of the question, may I ask Bill, maybe you would like to uh, 
answer this or respond to this comment? Yeah, certainly, I'd, I'd be happy to. So uh, the first question, I, I'm assuming that uh, what's being asked is uh, about putting UV inside of an air handling unit, which is one of the, um, the options. And uh, that can be quite effective for disinfecting air, but the, uh, the limitation of it is that the amount of uh, treated air that can be provided is limited to whatever air change rate the system can provide. So if you have a VAV system, maybe that's uh, six air changes per hour, more or less. Less if you have a VAV system and the load is, is turned down. Um, so it can be effective, but uh, we haven't seen a lot of transmission of virus through air handling units. And if you have a high efficiency filter there, there may not be a lot coming through that filter. On the other hand, if you put upper room inside of a space, that uh, treats the contamination in the space more directly. And I think that uh, in the current situation is, is more recommended. Uh, the second question about will HEPA filters remove coronaviruses? Uh, yes, uh, HEPA filters have been tested on viruses in the size range of, of coronavirus, but the, back to the point that I made earlier, that's really not the important uh, dimension. What, what we're really looking at is the, the size distribution of uh, uh, droplet nuclei that are residues that are formed from respiratory aerosols and uh, filter efficiency is very good for those. Uh, people tend to think that just because a HEPA filter is rated at 0.3 microns or uh, by ASHRAE 52.2, we only rate down to 0.3 microns, that everything below that is not filtered. And that's not true. It just isn't tested in the rating and, and the diffusional collection efficiency should actually go up. The third question, uh, why is ASHRAE not interested in ionization technology and focuses mainly on, on UVGI? Well, let, let me just say that about 15 years ago, um, the UV industry was sitting about where the ionization industry is, and they were telling me, why doesn't ASHRAE uh, have much interest in, in UV? Um, and the reason was that they were sitting on the outside of ASHRAE instead of being on the inside. And they said, well, instead of complaining, why don't you guys form a TC and, and really uh, in a non-competitive, pre-competitive, uh, objective way, uh, develop that technology within ASHRAE and they formed TC 2.9 and now we have two handbook chapters and two standards mm -hmm. and uh, we have evidence assembled that uh, gives ASHRAE confidence that technology works and I would invite people who are interested in these other electronic air cleaning technologies uh, to come in and uh, work from the inside of ASHRAE and, and one more thing I'd say in answer to this is there's actually a rigorous literature review on electronic air cleaners in progress right now. ASHRAE is extremely interested because of the level of interest in the public. And when that's published, I think we'll have a good uh, explanation for why ASHRAE has the position that it has on the level of evidence currently. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Cliff. Yeah. I believe that uh, for ionization technology, we also need uh, more technical discussions or uh, maybe a technical committee can be formed in ASHRAE to uh, look at how it could be uh, applied in uh, this sort of situations. Uh, we can uh, now refer to the second set of questions, uh, which is related to general issue. I think this, some of this general issue uh, uh, it so happened that, Luke, in your presentation, you have mentioned about a new way of arranging offices and, uh, and how to uh, uh, get people uh, uh, crowded uh, places uh, uh, to be uh, free from the virus. So they are some uh, question raised uh, by people from Indonesia. I think they are in a very critical situation at this moment. So they are worried about should HVAC system change in this uh, era of the pandemic or how to rebuild new normal for all the building operation to create healthy environment for everyone. Would you like to comment on this? Can hear you, Luke. Uh, Luke, we, we can't hear you. you. You have to turn on the turn on the mic. Oh, okay. Because uh, okay, I cannot yes. unmute myself now. You can hear me. So yeah, in the long in in the short term, there's um, most of the buildings will be limited to what the building has. Then in the longer term, maybe there are changes they can make 
for example, in the short term, let's say if you don't have enough uh, static pressure from your fan to overcome a stronger filter, so you may be limited to maybe increase outside air or other things. In the longer term, if you can adjust the fan, another measure, maybe you can put in a stronger filter. But then there's also a true longer term is look into the future, forward looking into the future, what are the elements could be coming and as we mentioned in the in the pub and uh, you know in the in the show just now maybe one of the things is focus on the particulates in the air that no not only just pandemic but also fire but also other issues and think about you know maybe a mer 13 filter is actually a good place to start and during this time of course if you want to change filter the caution is maybe there are elements in there though like what bill mentioned earlier chances are there's we do not know the entire truth yet, but chances are the majority of the virus is in the droplets. But nevertheless, it's probably cautionary to wear proper PPE per CDC guideline to do some of this measure in the in the short run when we have to take care of the field changing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Lute, for the comment. Uh, I think uh, not only HVAC systems, uh, and also architectural design and also many other of the building elements we are looking forward to a new normal to be set up uh, in the yeah, coming you know, future when, yes, when people what, are coming back to Yeah, one of the things we talk about is kind of funny in a way because North America, in, in North America, majority of the toilet doesn't have a lid, but in Europe, majority of the commercial toilet actually has a lid. So we are talking <laughs> about simple things like should we think about leads in toilet in the future. <laughs> oh, yes, I agree. Yeah. Okay, we also have the, the first set of uh, questions related more scientifically to aerosol, the deposition of aerosol on surfaces, no matter it's uh, inside the lift or in the handrails or in other uh, building surfaces, people are worrying about uh, this. So therefore they are looking for the most effective ways to minimize this aerosol contamination. Actually, we have question from Brazil and one uh, per, uh, a person from Singapore, they, he, he worked in the MTR, the mass transit railway system in Singapore. And I believe, uh, I believe that he's uh, also uh, have some worry about this aerosol contamination. Maybe uh, Chen Chen, would you like to respond to this uh, question from Singapore and Brazil? Well, I think, I think it goes back to the transmission modes that Bill was talking about earlier. Um, is very clear droplets, uh, the, the, the larger size droplets, say, you know, in the less than 100 microns, 20 to 100 microns, you know, they will fall by gravity. The larger the size, uh, uh, the shorter it's going to fall. So within that one meter distance we're talking about, a lot of the droplets might settle. But then you have uh, the smaller size droplets, five microns or smaller, even much smaller than, uh, say, the uh, uh, submicron particles like uh, 0.1 and that sort of size, uh, less than one micron, I mean. So you, they could potentially be in the short range, the one to two meter range, but they could be airborne. So I think we are still trying to understand what is happening even within the one to two meter distance uh, in terms of the transmission board. There is droplets, there is um, uh, airborne route that's happening within that range and then the droplet settling on the surface, the one that you just mentioned, somebody touches in the fomite transmission. So all of these things are happening continuously in all kind of, I suppose, enclosed environments. So Luke, your, your slide was very nice, the very first one, two outdoors, 7,000 something indoor. So that, 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 that tells it clearly. So you have uh, more chances of catching something from within an enclosed environment on all, I personally believe, a lot of us believe on all the modes. And it's very hard to differentiate which one is uh, contributing to the, to the most transmission. Probably the droplets, I wouldn't disagree with that thinking that in the short range between an infected person and uh, you know, a susceptible or a vulnerable person, you could have more of most of the droplet and the contact uh, mode of transmission. But think about even within the context of a room, you have a, a room say about uh, eight meters, 10 meters uh, distance, you could have short range airborne transmission. I mean, we would pro probably call that more like medium range. It's not something that's going through your duct work and coming back into the space, 
but within that space itself the eight meters ten meters distance you could have airborne transmission happening and some of these droplets could actually go further further than the two meter distance and settle on to other surfaces and you could have uh, fomite and contact transmission so i think it's an interesting science it's an interesting uh, feel that we are all in and we are beginning to appreciate how important it is for for our human i suppose uh, activities whatever we do and i think each of us as we take different um, uh, i suppose go through our active daily activities uh, we exercise caution at the individual level we follow guidelines or guidance provided at the country level i mean if we're asked to stay home we just stay home and there's a good reason for that. So you minimize all the chances of some of these primary modes of transmission kicking in. And if, I mean, remember elimination of source, I mean, you don't even give a chance for the source to happen for transmission to the individual. We can talk and discuss about this thing from a variety of perspectives, but I think uh, in this particular case, the SARS-CoV-2 case, the droplets has been probably, you know, responsible for a bulk of the transmission happening that we know of so far, um, but I think uh, there's there's uh, reasonable, I suppose, uh, thinking that we could have that there could be the other modes that we can't rule out at this point in time. So we need to be mindful of how each of this, or maybe collectively, all the different modes of transmission are happening together. Uh, it's probably a, a kind of a long answer to a short question that you asked, but I'm not sure what else uh, we could do at this time that be aware and and be mindful of what what we can uh, do at the individual level that's a good long answer chandra thank you <laughs> <laughs> yeah thank you thank you very much for your answer uh, it, uh, in fact uh, uh, in in order to control the virus for example in some uh, public transportation system for example in hong kong and i also saw in singapore uh, they are using some uh, uh, uv light on the uh, rail of the escalators, and also they use uh, robots to run around the place in the shopping centers in order to clean up the place before people get into. So we may need to take uh, different types of measure, I think, to control these uh, aerosols uh, contaminations. Yeah, I heard so about I that the robots, the UV robots going down uh, during unoccupied hours, but uh, yeah. I've been staying home, I haven't gone there and seen it myself. <laughs> we can remember that the next yeah. the next epidemic disease may have different characteristics and so these things that we're doing that cover all the possible transmission modes mm -hmm. i think are uh, mm -hmm. leading us in the direction of where our standards may wind up in the future yeah, yeah. i think i think yeah. one point i would like to add here sam is i think all that we have learned so far and it's still continue to learn with this pandemic with this coronavirus is also putting us to putting us in the context of how can we build the resilience of building and the systems in the future? Today, it's the coronavirus. Maybe tomorrow, we have had the issues of haze in the past. In California, you had the forest fires and the outdoor pollution at times. So there could be episodic driven events that may warrant us to go in a certain way. And I think unless the systems, the building systems uh, has the inherent uh, resilience, to adapt itself. Mm -hmm. we, I don't think we are going to say that you design something and put it in place that's going to function the same way all the time, right? That that could be, that could have energy implications. So I think we are talking about really resilience in design, resilience in buildings, which is probably the way to go to part of the new norm in my view going forward. I think that it's, it was uh, uh, strangely prescient or at least coincidental that the, the two main technical areas emphasized in the new ashtray strategic plan which was written before the pandemic started we're into environmental quality and resilience and and here we have both of those things coming together absolutely uh, okay excuse me we are coming uh, near the end of this uh, uh, webinars and uh, in fact uh, we try to uh, show our faces of the speakers and the moderators at the end of the q a section uh, make sure that uh, we are not robot we are not artificial intelligence in uh, conducting this uh, webinars. So uh, I hope that there will be uh, more discussions in different forms in the coming futures in ASHRAE or in some other societies. So uh, here I would like to thank uh, all the speakers for your effort and time spent. And we have a uh, very good discussions uh, near the end, but unfortunately we are not able to uh, 
satisfy all the questions raised during this uh, webinar, but we will try to uh, read it and uh, respond uh, or maybe put it in the FAQ uh, on our SV website later on so that people can review and other people can also re uh, refer to it. So once again, uh, I would like to thank the speakers, uh, also the SV staff behind the screen, which are supporting us uh, in the, this uh, past few weeks in organizing, uh, developing these uh, uh, events. And at the same time, of course, without the participants, participation of the audience, we have more than uh, 1,000 audience uh, attending, and maybe uh, some other will be watching this uh, uh, video later on at home. And I, I wish all of you good health and safe at home, <laughs> like what Chen Chao is doing in Singapore. And uh, we look forward to uh, uh, more information provided uh, from Mastery. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Sam. Organizers. Thanks, Sam.